All right, looks like we're live at this point. Um, just gonna give it time for people to load in and we'll be starting up here right about two o'clock. So we got a few minutes. Turn down my radio. <laughs> All right, so we do have some participants already. That's nice. And we'll be starting up here in another minute, right about two o'clock. And you say, give, give people a chance to sign in, get established, and we'll pick it up at two and go from there. All right, it's two o'clock. Let's get the show on the road. Uh, my name is Jeff Scott from Cornell Local Roads. I'm a technical assistance engineer there. And today we're going to talk about uh, understanding erosion and sediment control. So I guess to start off, we'll, uh, we'll have some questions pop up here. And there we are. We've got a few questions that you guys can answer. Um, we'll look to get about 75% response and then we'll uh, We'll uh, look at the results. And don't forget to scroll down and get question three as well. There's three questions there. All right, we're about 81%. Let's uh, in that polling and you know, let's see the first question is how many folks at your site 71% uh, say uh, no there's just one of you there's a couple sharing uh, advice when we're talking about PDHs on the next slide that uh, we'll talk a little bit more about sharing the screen uh, a lot of them local government that's good uh, a couple honest people the weekend and uh, See, uh, greater than 10 years. So we got a lot of people with experience here. Only 2% new people, so it's pretty small. But anyway, um, we'll stop with the sharing of the results. And make that go away. How about that? All right, we'll get on to the next one. As I mentioned with the PDHs, uh, we are offering one hour of a PDH for this. Working all of a sudden. All right. All right, we are offering one hour's one hour worth of PDH on this one uh, for New York State. If you're out of state, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But only the person registered. So if there's multiple on there, uh, be advised only the name that's registered will be able to get the PDH for that. Uh, that's all part of uh, state education part requirements. Um, to get a PDH, if you attend majority of the thing, we uh, the presentation here will uh, send your certificate. If you um, Spend over 90, 95% of it, we will uh, you qualify for uh, PDH. And then if you're in other states, we recommend you reach out to your local LPAT to see if the uh, PDHs are transferable to your state. Um, so we'll move on to the topics of the day. So the stormwater concerns talk about impacts from erosion sediment, um, the erosion sediment control basics, um, some of the practices that are out there. And then what about winter operations? We'll talk a little bit about that and winter shutdown and some management tips. Um, we also have uh, a handout that's available here that you can download. It's in the chat pod or uh, it's also available, be available after this uh, presentation is over. So for standards in New York, these are the standards we typically follow. Each state has their own set of standards. 
Um, most of them follow pretty closely with what the EPA has put out. Some of them have their own caveats and things that are specific to the state, but uh, these are the ones that we follow in New York, the New York standards, uh, New York State standards for erosion sediment control, otherwise known as the Blue Book that was recently updated. Uh, and then there's the stormwater management design manual that was updated in 2015. Uh, they're both fairly new. Um, the Blue Book itself, the one on the left, has uh, been updated and there are some new uh, sections in it. So if you're familiar with the old one, I recommend getting the, downloading the new one and just kind of going through it. So stormwater. Um, what is stormwater? Essentially rainwater and snow melt from rooftops, paved areas, bare soils, lawns, anything that basically where it doesn't infiltrate into the ground. Um, so pretty much once it starts moving, it's considered stormwater runoff. Uh, and that's where a lot of our problems actually come in. Uh, some of the problems basically the, as a runoff travels, it picks up litter, sediment, pesticides, fertilizer, uh, bacteria from animal waste, chemicals uh, from automobiles, and then there's other that it can pick up as well. So there's a lot of things that uh, get carried along with the stormwater as it travels across. So if we can contain that, control it, minimize any of those pollutants in there, we're going to be a lot better off uh, when that water gets to where it's going. Some of the impacts, a uh, variety of different types of impacts, but uh, untreated uh, excessive stormwater can do something like we see in the picture here, but uh, untreated stormwater can create significant environmental and public health and safety problems. Uh, polluted runoff is one of the biggest threats that we have as far as uh, our national waters. Uh, not only do they cause property damage, roads and bridges and beaches, but they can uh, impact uh, fishing areas, uh, financial areas by impacting beach closures and fishing uh, restrictions, uh, contaminating uh, drinking water, uh, stream bank erosion. All these things are related to uh, some of the stormwater impacts that we encounter and have to deal with. Uh, and the sediment is the big one. That's what we're gonna talk about today, the erosion and the sediment and try to keep it in place. So the question is, uh, at a site, at a mine, uh, the question is, where does it go? Um, you get these kind of co collections with all the sediment and all the debris and all the pollutants. Um, you know, you, you don't necessarily really think about where it does go, but it does go somewhere. Uh, downstream, typically, uh, can enter into a lake in some cases. Solution isn't really a solution here. In the worst case scenarios, you're going to get a lot of sediment. When that sediment collects, it's going to shield out and smother a lot of the small aquatic life vegetation. And with that, you're going to lose not only the aquatic life, but you'll lose the, the ability of um, the vegetation to create oxygen, which is going to reduce the amount of oxygen within that water. So it's important to know where we're going, what we're doing, and uh, what's traveling through there, and where it's going to go. Um, the basic concept anymore with the local, um, most of the stormwater plans are basically keep, um, keep the stuff on site. It's easier to deal with on a small scale than it is on the large scale. Uh, you don't want to pave areas anymore. We don't want large areas of pavement. Uh, a lot of things can happen when there's large areas of pavement. Worst of all is the accumulation of excess water. Uh, it's collected and channeled and creates all kinds of problems downstream. Ideally, if we can use rain guards, deal with it on individual sites as we travel through, it's going to be a lot more successful. And in some cases, if you've got the water and it's got pollutants in it, maybe you just want to filter it and train it. There are different treatments that are out there. Uh, we're not going to get too much into that, but there are different methods out there to treat some of the water as well. So there are different concepts. But the idea is basically deal with it on a small scale. It's a lot easier to control. And if we don't deal with it on the small scale, um, it does impact stream, stream life as well. So this is basically a hydrograph of steam for, uh, stream flow rate. As you see, it's got the base flow going across. That's where the stream normally flows. Uh, a rainfall will start over a period of time. You'll reach it. It'll slowly rise as that water saturates the ground and moves toward the stream to go downhill. Uh, the stream right, uh, elevation will rise and it slowly, gradually recede back to where it was in its normal state. Uh, once we've paved over these areas and we just kind of channel that water downstream, we get the higher peak flows. Uh, the, the time it takes for that flow to get through the watershed is, is substantially accelerated. So what that does is causes a lot of that uh, sediment, moisture, all that rainwater basically to uh, race down the hill at one point and then in through those streams and those retaining structures and all that. Uh, 
with the force and the velocity of the water uh, cause substantial amounts of damage. So we get a lot of stream erosion, we get a lot of surface erosion. I see we're having problems with the audio. I hope it's not the wind. Um, but again, you can see that um, by decreasing uh, our management of the water, letting that water run downhill, we're gonna have those higher peaks. Because those higher peaks come and go, uh, what we're gonna have is uh, a decrease in infiltration. As a result, our base flow in those streams are eventually gonna decrease. Uh, so we really wanna try to avoid that. If we can uh, flatten out the curve, as we've been saying for months now, uh, with the stormwater as well, uh, we're gonna be a lot more successful if we can mim mimic that and control it. Uh, some of the methods that are out there as far as how to minimize it, and we'll go into more detail on this here as it comes along. Uh, we wanna try to protect our natural resources, natural drainage channels, buffer zones, those kind of things that are gonna help um, maintain the flow as it was originally, uh, help filtrate some of the sediment that might have gotten loose and transferred through some of those buffer zones. Uh, if you've got an open construction site, you can, if you've got uh, heavy flows going through there, you might wanna just basically divert the flow around the site. Uh, and then of course, implementing and maintaining the sediment control, and we'll talk about it, that quite a bit. Uh, and just manage the stormwater runoff. Keep it slow, uh, contain it if it's, uh, slow it down, try to slow it down to the point where the sediment will drop out of it uh, and let the fresh water, the clean water move on. So some of the basics when it comes to erosion, uh, essentially erosion is our first line of defense. If we can keep the soil where it is, um, we're gonna be a lot more successful. We won't have to battle it downstream where it's already uh, gotten mobile. It's done through two different methods, runoff control, that's where you're dealing with the mo moving water itself, controlling it, slowing it down, uh, diverting it. Uh, and then there's soil, soil stabilization, that's where you're dealing with the earth, you're trying to protect the earth, keep it where it is, the soil where it is. Uh, and it's very effective. Uh, your last line of defense is basically once that, uh, is the sediment control. Once that sediment is mobile, it's very difficult to, to, to capture it and keep it transferring on. Uh, so it's easier to uh, keep water out of the sediment than it is to get the sediment out of the water. Uh, it's very difficult, especially on the larger scale projects. So if we can keep the material in place, prevent that erosion from happening, we're gonna be a lot more successful. Of course, runoff controls for erosion. These are some of the things basically, again, focused on that flowing water. Some of the things we can deal with as we go. Uh, there's diversions, swales, waterways, check dams, and we'll talk about these as we get going. First one is diversions. Simply, uh, the diversion is basically a conveyance channel um, designed and in place basically to divert offsite uh, drainage from the active construction site. It can be within the site, uh, offsite, or whatever, just uh, not within the construction area, but somewhere to divert that water from coming in and re reduce the amount of flow going into the construction site. Uh, typically, not permanent, but it can be. Uh, using rock line, uh, rock lining to stabilize the channel may be necessary. And of course, if you're gonna slip the, the stone, you're gonna wanna pick that, you're gonna base the stone, the stone size based on the velocity of the flow. Uh, so different, different practices that are out there. Uh, this is more of a permanent one. Um, they put in, while well, they're doing the construction, but it looks like they've kept it as a permanent one anyway. Swales and grass line waterways, essentially the same things, but they're wide, shallow channels um, with, with stabilized vegetation. Uh, the idea is that they're gonna convey runoff without kind of any kind of erosion uh, issues associated with it. The vegetation will help filter out some of the sediment. Uh, it'll slow down the flow. It'll help infiltrate back into the water table. So it's got a lot of benefits um, to it. Uh, if it does, that flow does get uh, high in some of those uh, grass line swales, uh, check dams are an option to try to slow that down. Uh, on the left, there's different types of check dams. On, uh, the type on the left basically is an energy dissipator check dam, where you have that water that goes over, it drops, and when it hits the uh, splash pad underneath, it's gonna dissipate energy. The idea is that you're gonna reduce the velocity on that, keep it moving, but keep it moving slow to a pace where it doesn't erode the forces, uh, the erosive forces don't uh, take the, uh, the native material there. Uh, the other side, temporary one, or they, they are permanent in some cases, but just uh, the stone check dams that are in there. Um, 
then again, you're going to restrict the velocity, usually slow it down. These, these are used more for collecting debris and slowing the velocity down on the right side. Um, as far as placement, typically it's going to be based on um, the slope that you're dealing with. You're going to want the toe of the upper one matching the, the, uh, the crest of the lower one. And you should, they should be built with a, a, a V-shaped tomb where the lower, uh, not necessarily a V, but a U-shaped tomb where the lower point is in the center of the uh, check dam itself to try to concentrate the water as it goes away. Uh, stone size, typically you're going to want to use something between two and nine inches. Um, line it with fabric to underneath, try to keep it from undermining. Uh, maybe if it's on a steep hill, you want to use some sort of cutoff trench uh, to try to stabilize it and keep it from sliding. Uh, again, the, again, the stone size is going to be dependent on um, the velocity of the water flow going through there. There are some other types that are coming out, manufactured types. Some of them are flexible, reusable, runoff control products for shallow flows. Uh, they work with low gradient slopes, but they're limited by the flow and the velocity. And again, that's related to the slope. Uh, it's a case of a core log. Uh, they're lightweight, they're very porous. Um, they do allow some of that flow to go through there. They stop the sediment that's, uh, you know, basically it's uh, similar to a check dam, but allows the flow to go through. You need to, again, you need to install these proper for them to be effective. Um, and you're still the same concept with uh, the, the crest of the lower one is uh, at the toe of the upper one. And that, that keeps uh, the elevation drop to a consistent level. That reduces its potential for accelerating as it drops downhill. Some check dam issues. Sill fence should not be used as a check dam. Um, it's not porous enough. What happens, if you can see on this picture on the right here, that um, there's a lot of erosion. It just kind of goes around. Um, that, that They're a poor choice. They're not porous enough. They're not effective. They're just basically a waste of time. Uh, hay bales at the other and the other don't work well as check dams either. Uh, typically, they get bypassed, but more often, they uh, because they get by. Well, one of the reasons that cause them to get bypassed is that they get saturated, they get wet, the straw swells up, and it basically seals it. Um, so it's causing causing it to go around. Uh, using the wrong material, using some too small of material stones, uh, the check dam too flat where it's not effective. Um, See, there, these are some of the issues that are associated with check dams. Um, so just to be aware, some things to look for when you're doing that. Lined waterways, essentially a channel lined with rock, concrete, or other, some other permeable material. Uh, the idea is that it's going to convey runoff without causing erosion. A lot of times you'll do it on a steeper slope. Uh, try to protect that. You're going to underline it with some sort of filter fabric. And then again, the right size is going to be based on the velocity of the flow. Uh, and you'd want to use this when check dams become too much. Uh, you've got them every two feet or something that it's a little bit, a little bit excessive. So um, you might want to use a rock line base here. The, this photograph here is uh, basically gabion mattresses that they formed a center one that couple wings and the wing ones going down either side. Um, it seems to work. So uh, it's just another idea that's out there. This is another one that was installed after Irene and Lee came through. This was done by the state. Uh, but you can see the bottom is flat. It's got a wide uh, bottom on there to try to disperse the flow. And it's uh, rock line. So it's, again, size for the flow. The flow that came through there is enormous. So they've designed it so it's got some larger stone. <coughs> some other options that are out there. Um, these are some of the things that have been done in the Adirondacks. They've got, uh, on some of the steep slopes, some of that uh, larger stone is actually still moving. Uh, so what they've done is gone back and they've kind of um, essentially poured a slurry down the top to try to just stabilize the top. And uh, not without removing the stones, keep the roughness, keep the coarseness of it. There. So it's still effective as far as reducing the velocity. Um, but just other, other ideas that are out there. Outlet protection, basically a rock, riprap, or concrete at the outlet of the culvert. The reason we use these is... Uh, and you've got a, a ditch or a stream or whatever's coming approaching a culvert, uh, typically uh, that stream or ditch has a, lighter, a, a big surface area that it's traveling in. You get through the pipe, it's actually going into a smaller surface area. So th for the flow to continue to get the same quantity through there, you're going to have to accelerate. And in some cases, that water accelerates quite a bit to get through uh, some of these smaller pipes. And that's the purpose of the rock at the outlet is to slow that velocity down, dissipate the velocity, uh, 
decrease the depth of it coming out of the pipe, uh, reduce the energy essentially, de reproduce, eliminate the uh, erosive impact that's in there. And again, rock size is gonna depend uh, on the flow that you're anticipating. So insulation is critical. Um, you need to bed it well so it doesn't undermine. Uh, you wanna finish it below the culvert, otherwise you're gonna get sediment buildup in the culvert and it'll just be another headache later on. So if you can put the bedded, if you don't use the rock, you're gonna get some sort of scour under there. You're gonna get the head cut. It's gonna work its way under that culvert. Um, so that's, uh, again, another one of the reasons for having that there. Uh, flared X end sections on the pipe, they don't serve. They just help um, open up the pipe, reduce some of the scour there, but they do not, uh, they don't provide that outlet protection at all. So if you've got um, runoff from a, impervious surface area and you're trying to stabilize an embankment that runs down from that impervious surface area uh, without some sort of method of protecting that uh, potentially that new vegetated area, you're going to get all kinds of rills and erosion that go through there. Uh, pipe slope drain is actually an option that you can use to uh, capture that, collect it, uh, and then discharge it at the bottom of the hill. Uh, just basically the idea is to temporarily get it over there. Uh, not all are temporary. But in these cases, in this situation, this one's gonna be temporary. Um, and again, it's basically to try to get that erosive force to the bottom of the hill. Uh, these are some pictures I took from out west. Uh, they're used a little bit differently out there. Uh, not that we couldn't use them around here the same way. Uh, but this is actually a collection coming off a paved area. You've got the curb uh, as it runs downhill. Uh, the other side, basically, it's a larger pipe that discharges down below. Um, again, they're getting it away from that slope. They, they use them, um, they use these pipe slope drains on the west coast as well, where you've got these big embankments where they go from the road level down to the sea level, uh, just to avoid that uh, erosive forces below and taking the road out. This is kind of a section of detail of what they are. Again, if minimum of a 3% slope, you don't want sediment building up in there. Uh, the steeper the slope, the higher the velocity it's gonna be in there. So uh, putting some sort of uh, Catchment stone um, sediment basin, again, similar to an outlet structure to sort of slow that velocity down, capture any sediment. Um, so there, there are designs in there. This is out of the, uh, the blue book itself. There's a lot of these designs are all in that blue book. So it's, this, this section right here is directly out of the blue book. So this is basically a water bar. Typically you'll use that on a roadway where you've got water running down it. You wanna to try to get it off of that roadway. Uh, can be temporary or permanent, but it conveys the runoff in a non-erosive manner uh, along the slopes at predetermined intervals. Again, it's going to depend on the velocity and the volume you have is where you're going to put them. Um, but you want to try to uh, reduce that moisture on the water itself and just kind of divert the water from the road surface. Is that what these really do? So that's dealing with the land portion of it. Now we're going to try to deal with, or that was dealing with the water control of it. So we're going to look into the stabilizing the soil itself. So we'll talk about these topics here. And again, we'll go through each of them as we did uh, previously. Land grading, basically reshaping of the land surface to provide for erosion control and vegetation establishment. Um, basically capturing that water, don't let it go off site. You can see they built a little berm here on the right side. Uh, capture any kind of water and disturbance that comes from it. Um, they put mulch material on the other side. Um, hasn't started to take root yet. Uh, again, inspections should be done. Uh, but again, the idea is to capture that water, uh, use, grade the land to capture any kind of runoff from the site, from leaving the site. Just another example of how, how some have done it. Um, Basically incorporating sto uh, slope stability, drainage patterns, diversions. Um, if you're gonna have cut and fills, have them on the plan. So um, what you're doing is known before that as part of your erosion sediment control plan. Um, if you're gonna do tracking uh, on any of these slopes to help stabilize them, um, go up and down. So you've got the, uh, the, the track itself is perpendicular to the flow. Um, and then they'll serve as little mini check dams. Uh, so grading the land can be important as well as try to keep that material on site. Topsoiling, uh, breading topsoil materials on graded areas to provide acceptable plant cover for growing conditions. Again, if um, you're, you're gonna be planting things, uh, you, want the, you want the soil to be receiving them. Um, by using the topsoil, in many cases, uh, you'll see contractors will pile that topsoil up in a variety of different 
places using stockpiles. And we'll talk about that coming up as well. But um, when you have all this topsoil, you, you definitely want to reuse it. You don't want to have to purchase that. If you've already scraped it on site, you want to put it back. Um, by using that reuse, that topsoil, you're going to reduce erosion. Uh, you'll reduce any kind of fertilizer needs because it's got the organics. Um, shouldn't it, it should be uh, should minimize your irrigation requirements because it's got, it's got the organics that are going to hold some of that moisture. And typically, you're going to want between six and twenty percent organic matter in there, uh, free of woody debris, stones, and topsoiling is uh, required on most construction sites. Seeding again, once you've topsoiled it, you want to go back and seed it. Um, ideally, you're going to use an annual seed, so you've got an early sprout. It's going to protect the soil right away. Uh, then you're going to want some perennial vegetation on there as well. Uh, again, something that's going to come up next year and hold the roots and keep that stable over a longer period of time. Uh, seeding is required for nectar areas because it does help stabilize the soil. Uh, can reduce soil loss by up, by up to 90%. If you can turn that to vegetation, it's going to help filter it and infiltrate uh, a lot of that runoff. And before you seed it, you really want to decompact the soil if it's necessary, rake, scarify the soil before the seeding. And then after you've put the seed on it, you can track that, track, pack it in a little bit. Um, so again, seeding is critical as far as getting that vegetation to grow and reducing that erosion uh, that you're going to be dealing with. Uh, similar to seeding is hydro seeding. Again, obviously it's water and seeds. Uh, pressure, it's a pressure spraying of a seed mix uh, in a liquid form through a nozzle essentially. Uh, it includes again the annual and perennial uh, seeding and the seed's going to depend a lot on your area. You're going to want something that's going to grow and that's native to your area. You don't want to bring some um, outside vegetation in that's going to create problems. Uh, but it also can, uh, the hydro sprayer can also include fertilizer if you need it. If you're using topsoil, um, you're going to lead, need less. I would recommend testing your soil to see if you even need it at all. If you have excess fertilizer, it travels, it doesn't stay. Um, if you get on a slope, you may want to tack a fire, some sort of polymer or material to help it stick to the ground. Um, but it's an easy, uh, very effective way to get a germination rate, get that ground restabilized. Um, and it's really good on critical areas and slopes. Um, one of the places you don't want to do it is put it on top of any kind of erosion control blanket. If you're going to put something like this down, put it before you put the blankets down. Um, and if you're going to put it on steep slopes, you may want to mulch it or use the proper tackifier. So just be aware there's some caveats that go along with it. You also want to get it, a good cover on there. Um, a poor cover isn't going to provide the protection that it's needing. Um, again, a lot of what this uh, hydro seeding does once it's sprayed on there, it's going to help protect the seed. It's going to hold moisture, uh, similar to what mulch does. Um, so a good coating on it's going to help. Speaking of mulch, <laughs> typically a coarse residue or chips uh, placed over the soil. And uh, basically what this does is it protects the seedling, protects it from the sunshine, the temperature variations, protects it from the erosive forces of raindrop velocity. Uh, it helps stabilize the soil in non-growing seasons. It can be permanent, you know, you can use stone if you need to, but uh, if you're looking to get vegetation in there, uh, mulch with seed underneath it is going to be uh, very useful. It does lessen the temperature fluctuations from night and day too, so you get uh, better performance out of your seeds. If you haven't got time for seeding and the time to grow, uh, sod is a good way to go. It's a rolled turf grass. It's typically grown in farms. They cut it up, roll it, and bring it to a site. Um, it stabilizes the soil almost instantly. Uh, it helps filter the runoff. It's a quick cover. Uh, and it really it looks pretty good when it's done. Uh, something like this can also be done in the late, uh, late season. Again, it's going to cost a little more than seeding, but it's, you've got a finished product for the most part, a stable site once you've once you've put this material in. Erosion control products, there's a variety of them and it really depends on what you want to use it for. There's temporary ones, the, the uh, ones that are straw based, uh, string uh, material held together. Uh, some of them have biodegradable uh, nylon pieces that are in there again. Some of them are just temporary. Uh, straw lasts about six months. Uh, once you get to the, the coconut hair, the koi material, um, it can go up to two years. And then there's other material that are a little bit more stable. There's a combination of straw and the koi material, uh, or there's just strictly nylon material that is uh, all simply synthetic. Um, 
that's usually used on steeper slopes. And again, this, if you're going to seed it, you want to top soil and seed underneath it and roll this top over top. And again, it's going to protect the seedling, preserve, uh, conserve the moisture that's in there, lessen the temperature fluctuations, break the raindrop velocity, all those same things that mulch does. Uh, but these are actually pinned down and again, they, they stabilize a little bit uh, more securely. Um, you can stabilize in non growing seasons as well. Um, but again, um, pick, the, pick the material you're looking for and for how long it needs to be. If you're planning on mowing it, uh, you don't want to get something that's not biodegradable. It'll just wrap up in your mowers. Um, installation, they should be placed vertically, not horizontally. And they should be worked from the downhill up so you've got an overlap. So the flow running down the hill is going to go over the over top of the edge of the other one and not under have that potential for going underneath. Uh, they should be pinned. Um, and if you've got really steep slopes, you've probably better idea to terrace them than try to cover them up, stabilize them in one shot. In this case, they were at the end of the season, so they pretty much stabilized everything. Um, you can see in the back corner there in the upper left it is that diversion trench around the site that we saw a little earlier. But again, another use for these, uh, some of these um, erosion control products that are out there. Dust is another source of erosion, not just water. Um, Erosion basically is the loss of material. Uh, it can be taken by water, but it also can dry out and be taken by uh, the wind. Uh, so you also want to try to control that dust on your site. Because uh, again, that's your material. Uh, it, as that material lifts and goes into the vegetation, it, again, it'll layer on top of plants, similar that the sediment does in a lake. Uh, so you want to try to avoid that. Um, there are options out there. Um, the driving areas, you can spray it, uh, spray water on it, sprinkle water on it. Um, add polymer additives, you can create barriers or use windbreaks to try to stabilize it. Um, maybe some sort of uh, chloride, the, the, the mag chloride, calcium chloride, uh, I don't know if the sodium chloride is used all that much, but uh, some sort of chloride uh, spray on the roads. If you're going to use something like the chloride though, make sure that um, make sure that you're not going to have rain within a couple days because that stuff will migrate if it's too fresh in the ground yet. Uh, so just some things to remember. Uh, Non-driving areas, again, you can use vegetation, mulch, spray adhesives. Uh, but again, we want to try to control that dust as well. Stockpiles, I mentioned that a little earlier. Uh, stockpiles are um, critical for preserving good soil, uh, but we also need to keep an eye on them. They do, uh, they do tend to migrate. So typically, uh, to avoid any kind of migration erosion, essentially, from the wind, you want to try to minimize the heights because the wind is higher further up you go. Um, so be aware of that. And around, the, around a stockpile, you wanna put some sort of sediment control um, method. In this case, they've used a silt fence, but um, at least a minimum of 10 feet from the, the, the toe of the slope, and that'll help um, stabilize and capture anything that might come off of that, um, that, that stockpile itself. Ideally, if it's gonna sit for any kind of length of time, 14 days or greater, you're gonna to wanna to stabilize it, whether it's uh, applying a mulch or a seed if it's idle, maybe covering it with a material. Uh, but ideally, if you can get some vegetation growing on there, it's going to last a lot longer. It'll be require minimal uh, maintenance, and uh, you just have to keep an eye on it. But again, you want to save that material for later because that's valuable. You don't want to have to go buy that. So if we can keep it where it is, we're going to get a lot more, a lot more success. <clears throat> so sediment control. Now everything is basically we missed the opportunity to divert the water or keep it on site. Um, we've missed the opportunity to stabilize the soil. So now we're dealing with the controls of it moving. Uh, and this is really where it gets difficult. Uh, again, some of the practices that are out there, um, stabilize construction entrance access. Uh, the idea for this is basically uh, is to reduce any kind of sediment from the site going out onto the public roads. It's typically it's a stabilized pad of aggregate um, placed over uh, geotextiles at the points where you exit and enter a, a job site. Um, the idea is basically that you're gonna reduce that sediment going on onto those roads by shedding it onto that gravel before it gets to the roads. Uh, minimum width for these are typically 24 feet. Um, that's gonna change in winter times. You're gonna want, to, you're going to want it wider. Uh, and at least a length of 50 feet on commercial sites and a minimum of 30 feet on residential sites. You know, the vehicles are a little smaller on residential sites. Uh, Tires are smaller, the wheels are smaller, so you're gonna shed a lot of that stuff a lot sooner. 
Uh, typical size for the stone is between one and four inches. And again, there is a material underneath it, a separation material underneath it. Um, and you don't, one of the things you don't want to do is use a, a material that's less than an inch. Um, but they are used quite widely anymore. Um, but they are useful, again, as well, taking some of that sediment and keeping it off of the roadways themselves. Uh, silt fence, we're all familiar with silt fence. It's basically a geotextile barrier. Um, serves to basically slow water down. Uh, intercepts sediment-laden runoff, typically sheet flows, or preferably sheet flows only. Uh, and the idea is that it's gonna uh, reduce the velocity. And by reducing the velocity, it's gonna allow the sediment to fall out. Uh, doesn't serve as a filter, although moisture can get through it. Um, but it, it, again, it's focused on sheet flow and installation. You're gonna wanna put it on the same contour. Uh, you don't want them going up and downhill because they'll just create channels. Um, you don't want to, you want to try to avoid any concentrated flow. You do not want to put silt fence in a concentrated flow, uh, a stream ditch or anything like that, uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't have that porosity. It's just going to, the water will overwhelm it and knock it down. Uh, for them, silt fence to really be valuable and effective, you really need to bottom, uh, bury the bottom of it. It should be buried a minimum of six inches, uh, soil compacted back on them. And that keeps any kind of buildup or runoff that collects on the upper side. Uh, if it builds up in any kind of mass, it will prevent it from blowing out from underneath it. Um, you want to put your stakes on the on the downhill side. You want the you want that uh, any kind of force to be pushing on the stakes. You don't want to be pulling on the staples. Um, and they're usually typically a one year one year design life. Um, although I've seen them in much longer, you don't want to do that. Uh, ideally, utilize the site before then. Uh, some of the newer versions have the metal lath, like you can see in this photograph here. Uh, some of them even have metal poles if you've got some situations where that is um, a need. Compost filter sock uh, or a mulch filter sock. Generally a temporary uh, practice. Uh, and the idea is to filter sediment and other pollutants uh, to try to prevent their migration from off-site. Um, again, focus on sheet flow. It intercepts that sediment-laden runoff. Uh, again, you want to put these on the contour as well. Uh, you don't want to create channels using these. Uh, on the ends, you can see the, on the lower one here, they kind of turn that angle up. Um, the idea behind that is basically you're going to, it, it won't run along the edge of that uh, piece of material and uh, create a channel somewhere. Uh, so it basically holds that water where it needs to be. These things come in diameters between 12 and 32 inches, uh, and they can get very heavy when they get large, but um, Ideally, they're a temporary, uh, temporary item, as I mentioned, with a design life of about uh, six months. Uh, one of the benefits of these is uh, you can basically take a knife through them and take the material that's in it after you're all done using it and use it as mulch. Uh, so it's pretty much um, very good as far as uh, multiple purposes. If it's not uh, completely clogged, you could actually reuse it over again if you want. But again, you want to stake it, stake it properly. Uh, if you're putting it on an area where there's a potential for any kind of water running under it, you may want to pack the upper side with some soil, try to keep it from avoiding any kind of concentrated flow. Uh, you want to fill them adequately so they're round and not just a flat thing. Uh, and you really don't want to leave them too long in place and you do want to try to keep an eye on them and maintain them. Sensitive area protection. And basically you're preserving your natural resources. Um, but in doing that, you need to be conscious that um, a lot of equipment operators aren't looking for signs and that kind of stuff. So uh, before a project starts, you really have, have everybody that's out there know where these sensitive areas are. Uh, placing sense, special fencing, signage uh, to delineate it, um, and try to regulate the areas that you don't want them going into. And the idea again is try to protect any kind of sediment that's coming off of your site. Um, make sure that it's visible for the operator, your controls are visible for the operators. Um, might require heavy duty stakes and definitely you should use some sort of signage restricted area, uh, whatever it might be. Um, and again, you want to try to keep an eye on this stuff too. You want to keep them maintained. You want to make sure they're up so people don't forget over the course of a project. Uh, it's not unusual for the first phase of the project to be complete and a phase later, people are in there ripping and tearing and completely forgot about that protected wetland. Um, but again, just protecting those sensitive areas are going to help preserve, preserve that natural environment. Um, and it, it's going to be a lot easier in the long run. It's going to be a lot better. Uh, sediment basins and traps, they're nearly the same thing. 
uh, just in how much they're actually taking in. Uh, temp basically a temporary excavation or embankment to control sediment. Uh, a basin will typically drain an area of about 50 acres or less. Uh, a trap is for a smaller drainage area, uh, five acres or less. Um, as far as maintenance goes on these, when the sediment reaches about 50% capacity, um, you're gonna wanna have that thing cleaned out. Uh, any higher than that, when the water comes in, it just stirs up the sediment. The sediment gets re um, back into the, uh, the water itself and then leaves the site. So if you can try to let that sediment settle out and give it room to settle, it's gonna be a lot more effective. Um, typically these outlet, these structures will have some sort of trash, uh, trash rack or dewatering, some uh, dewatering structure in them. And some of them are basically designed to just uh, infiltrate into the ground. But uh, if you're collecting sediment, it could uh, reduce infiltration. So uh, having some means of uh, dewatering the basin and trap is good. Again, different versions of them. Um, if you got something like that and you're building it, um, remember you do need to maintain them. Um, it might be a good idea to build the benches so you can actually get down there with a backhoe or something. Uh, just be aware it needs maintenance and uh, you've got steep embankments alongside that make it difficult to get through. It's gonna make it difficult to clean. Uh, but just be aware that there are things that are there. You do have to maintain them, so build them so they're maintainable. Here's a dewatering device, essentially for a sediment basin, basically a temporary device to remove water from a sediment trap or basin. And it's just a skimmer device where the, uh, where the, uh, the device just kind of floats on top of the water and it takes water from below the surface and then uh, relocates to another point. Um, it can be done by pumping or whatever, but it's, uh, again, you're gonna move that clean water out of that basin and move it to a, an offsite waterway site so it can infiltrate in and um, get back into the ground without uh, getting back into the waterways. There are other options. Um, this one in fact is used as a dewaterer. Um, I've seen these used for uh, lowering the water table, uh, putting in bridge abutments and that kind of stuff. Uh, so essentially it's just not more than a, a perforated pipe surrounded by stone um, and then within there that uh, the pump uh, suction point is at the bottom there and basically draws the water out, pumps through the discharge, and then from the discharge it goes to a dewatering, uh, uh, deep, the, the filtering structure of some sort. Um, one of the options for that is a geotextile filter bag, uh, which is basically a temporary geotech, temporary device, uh, clean uh, silt laid, sediment laden material. You pump it out of your, your water area, um, you pump it through the trap, uh, and you retain that sediment within the trap itself, this filter bag, uh, anything that might be in it, the, and then that water comes out of it and then just oozes into the ground. Ideally, you're gonna wanna locate this at least 50 feet from any kind of water body, uh, water channel. Uh, should be placed on stone or gravel, so it encourages that infiltration. I see they haven't done that in this photograph. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's pretty valuable. I've seen other options out there as well. Uh, hay bales staked around a piece of plywood uh, and then pumped in there and then it's filtered through the hay bales. Uh, there are different options that are out there. Um, but this is just one of them that's uh, being promoted. But, uh, other options, are a rock dam. Basically using the contours of the land, land creating a rock dam, uh, channeling water to it to, uh, to allow it to infiltrate through that stone, typically a rock embankment. The idea again is for to capture that sediment. Um, you don't wanna locate these in stream channels, um, but what you do is you take that, the stone itself and then you put a fine layer of stone over the larger stone and that, the fine stone helps filter out a lot of that sediment. Um, as far as the uh, seepage rate, um, you're gonna want about 3,600 cubic feet of storage per acre for drainage area. So I'll just be conscious that they, they do take up space. All right, let's see. Storm inlet protection. This is another way, again, trying to, uh, uh, looks like we got a uh, question here. What are they trying to achieve with silt fence? Uh, essentially slowing the water down. Okay. Essentially you want to try to capture that sheet flow uh, and allow that sediment to flow, uh, to fall out of it. And it gives you a place to clean that sediment up before it ends up somewhere else. Um, I guess the same concept with these storm inlet protections. They put the stone around it 
Uh, the water will come up to it. The water will stop basically and it'll infiltrate through the stone itself. Um, a different one, these are temporary barriers around an inlet. And the idea is they trap water and as that water stops flowing, it drops out that sediment. Um, and these, there's a variety of different types of uh, inlet protections. You got this uh, stone one. Uh, it can be an excavated one where you put a structure within it. Uh, it can be fabric. Uh, it's an example of a fabric. Uh, just be aware if you're going to put something like this around there. Uh, again, that's similar fabric to a silk fence, so it doesn't, it's not porous. It will allow some of that water to weep through, but the idea is to slow that water down and capture it on the outside. Uh, because you have buildup of water, you're going to have that pressure from the, the load of the water. So you want to you want to build a structure around it so it's strong enough to hold it. Um, another one, basically a stone and rock, stone block with a block with stone around it. Again, the idea is to slow that water down, uh, slow that silt laden water down and allow it to stop, and allow that sediment to fall out of it. The concrete washout, this is a new one in the uh, blue book. Uh, I think, <laughs> but I think, yeah, it's pretty, it's a, another one. The idea behind this is uh, instead of having the concrete truck after it's poured the concrete, just turn around and dump it into the woods like has been happening for the last 30 years. Um, basically you have these temporary excavations or above ground line pits where the, uh, you can uh, wash this equipment out. Um, the idea is basically to try to reduce the alkalinity uh, from in the runoff from either entering a storm drainage systems or leaching into the soil. Uh, minimum sizes are typically eight by eight, eight foot by eight foot by two feet deep. Uh, and you're gonna wanna locate these at least 100 feet from any kind of storm water, drainage systems or surface waters. Uh, and they should, and they must be lined, the bottom must be lined to try to prevent that leaching of the alkalinity into the soils. Uh, once the concrete hardens, you can basically bust it out and you can use it, uh, take it either to a construction landfill or use it on site for fill material. Uh, but you're gonna wanna empty this when it reaches percent. Again, once it reaches that point, it becomes uh, pretty ineffective. Uh, temporary access bridge. Again, if you've got a, a waterway on your site and you need to get to the other way, uh, other side, there are there are options. You could put a bridge, a small bridge over to it. Uh, you can see they've actually got an anchor port in case the water comes up and takes it away. Um, another option is putting in culverts, temporary culvert crossings. And again, it's going to vary depending on if you've got steep slopes or, or steep banks or flat banks. Um, and again, these are all part of the blue book. They're in there. Uh, but it gives you options. Uh, turbidity curtain. Um, but once you've got that uh, silt-laden runoff and it starts to get away, uh, this is basically uh, one of your last lines of defense as far as preventing it from getting into these larger bodies of water. Uh, it's a flexible and penetratable impenetrable ba barrier uh, that tra traps the sediment within um, within that water before it spreads out and gets away. Um, the top is typically a floatable material and the bottom is weighted to try to keep it down. Um, again, using for short, uh, short durations. Uh, there are different ways of doing it. Um, you can, if you've got a conduit that's discharging, uh, you can actually put it around as a circular barrier around there. Um, if you're doing a construction along a shoreline and you want to protect that water from getting any kind of material into it, you could put along parallel to the shoreline itself. Um, and then there's in-channel uh, in containment too, but again, this is going to have to be a low flow situation, uh, but there are options for them. So, <clears throat> ah, Sediment control, the maintenance, the idea is basically anytime you've got that sediment buildup, you, you need to empty it at a 50% capacity. Uh, once again, once it reaches uh, above 50%, it becomes pretty much ineffective. That sediment becomes mobile again. Uh, with the disposal of sediment, you want to put that upland if you can, uh, ideally away from any kind of streams or drainage ways, and uh, preferably spread it out, grade it, seed it. Uh, it'll make good, good, good growing medium for the vegetation. Uh, what you don't want to use is put this underneath as road fill. It is sediment. It's fine. It'll attract moisture. It'll heave in the frost. Uh, it'll cause all kinds of things. So you don't want to use it as fill in your road foundations. And then with the idea with the sediment control and the maintenance, using multiple practices to work in uh, concert with each other in combination is much more effective than just using one and hoping it's done. I got a question. What happens when the turbidity curtain is no longer needed? 
the sediment that was trapped will be free to migrate. Uh, I believe there's methods of pulling that out. Uh, you may want to try to dewater it as well. Um, you're not going to get it all, all obviously, but ideally um, pulling that tight and pulling it up, uh, trying to capture that sediment. Again, that is a problem. That was, there's always going to be some loss there, but uh, you want to be trying to be conscious and careful of it. So we've got uh, soil restoration. Uh, one of the more critical things, I don't know how many construction sites I've been on and uh, years later that there's still nothing growing in the fields and the lawns. That's because a lot of equipment compacts that soil. Uh, so when it comes to real uh, soil restoration, uh, what they require now is basically any kind of compacted soil. You need to go back and rip it. Take a, a farmer's plow or whatever it might be or a soil ripper, get down about a foot or so and rip that material up. Um, because you want to kind of can, and by doing that, um, you're going to you're going to open up the pore spaces within the soil. It's going to improve its uh, infiltration ability. It's going to make it a lot easier for anything to grow on. Uh, it's going to help sustainable vegetation growth on it, improve the water quality, reduce the runoff coming off of there, filter pollutants, and it is required on most construction sites. Uh, some states are requiring uh, specific travel ways for that equipment. So uh, you're not traveling all over the site, you're traveling in specific road paths, and that helps focus a little bit where you're gonna decompact as well. Uh, but again, it's gonna vary by state. Winter operations. Uh, if you are working in the winter, uh, be aware that drainage patterns change based on the frost and the snow level and that kind of stuff. Um, access points, or your uh, construction access points are gonna be smaller because of snow banks. Uh, just being aware of all these things. And then uh, a lot of these things, a lot of your practices, silt fences and that kind of material is, are going to be hidden by the snow. Uh, so be conscious of where that material is, uh, that those uh, practices are, try to avoid them. Um, there's a limitation of frozen soil, you know, as far as uh, doing anything with it, it's hard to compact because it's, it, once it thaws, it's different. Uh, so it's going to be is also going to be difficult. Uh, if you're planning on winter, it should be part of your erosion control sediment plans. Um, you're going to want to enlarge to your uh, stabilized access by 20 foot, uh, your access point by quite a bit. Uh, you're going to want to put a 25 foot buffer around all of your controls. Uh, if you've got water bodies, you're going to want to try to set up a couple rows of silt fence um, that are within 100 feet of there. Um, keep drainage structures open and free of snow. Uh, place sediment bar barriers around stockpiles in sensitive areas. Um, protect stockpiles and slopes greater than 3% with rolled erosion control blankets. Um, uh, basically, if you're going to put mulch on it, uh, a minimum of four tons per acre of straw. Uh, and you don't want to leave anything open more than three days. Um, and then additional sediment barrier needs to be placed 15 feet away from the stockpiles. Uh, again, all this needs to be done before the snow flies. So be, if you're going to be doing this, you want to have these installed before the snow flies. Winter shutdown is a little bit different. This is where you're not working on the project. Um, that's where your construction, your disturbance is completely suspended uh, and, your, and your site is properly stabilized uh, prior to the shutdown, you shut down. Whether it's vegetation, mud, mulch, uh, erosion control products, rock, whatever it might be. Uh, you want that site properly stabilized before you walk off it, before the snow flies. Uh, once you do plan on shutting down, um, at least in New York, you need to contact the regional DEC office or the regulated traditional MS4s that are in charge and let them know that you've shut down for the winter. Uh, just because you're shut down doesn't mean you can walk away though. Uh, you need to check your sediment control measures after every rain and snow melt event. Um, your inspection frequency can be reduced to every 30 days if everything that I've just mentioned has been uh, been achieved. Uh, so you can reduce them, but you can't abandon the site totally. Uh, so you need to keep an eye on it. So some of the management tips, Let's see we're getting close to time here. Um, again, idea is to keep the clean water clean. If you can avoid that water, any off-site water from getting into an opened uh, soil area, um, keeping that water away from it, keeping it clean, letting it go around, you're gonna be a lot more successful. Once that water gets onto your, uh, that moisture runoff, whatever gets onto your site, it's gonna create havoc. So if you can divert it, uh, you're gonna have a lot more success in just dealing with your disturbing. Uh, preserving those natural areas, uh, the natural drainage areas, vegetative buffers, all of this stuff should be done during the planning stage, but 
uh, just being aware that uh, if you can preserve those natural drainage areas and those drainage courses, uh, leave some sort of vegetative buffer between there, it's going to help minimize any kind of sediment that might turn that might get away. Um, as far as uh, erosion controls, you want them in before you start rubbing and grading. Um, you want to once you've got that site open, you're going to want as part of that you're going to want your sediment trapping practices open and ready to go before you start disturbing. Then you want to try to run divert any kind of runoff to those practices. Um, again, if you can prevent that erosion at the source, it's going to be a lot. You're going to be a lot more successful before it leaves the site. It's going to be a lot easier to deal with. Your maintenance is going to go down. Um, if your site's going to be idle for 14 days, you definitely want to try to grade stabilize it. Um, if you've got over five acres exposed, you're going to want to. It, 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 the limitation is seven days, so you're going to want to stabilize that as well. Um, and when it goes from phases into project, whether you're moving from the, the roadway phase to the construction house phase, uh, you wanna make sure, or the second phase or whatever the construction might be, you wanna make sure the first phase is stabilized before you go to the next. And again, all these phases should be part of your construction, your construction plans as far as stormwater management. Um, so, and then of course, inspecting and maintaining throughout the project, uh, not after the roads are put in, the infrastructure is put in, but after, you know, continue to do those um, erosion sediment control inspections. All right, we got a couple of questions here, and then we got a couple some examples that we're going to try to uh, talk about here a little bit. Um, so we got two questions here, um, and if we can get you know seventy five percent of who's here, we can get uh, what the answers are. Uh, what is the first line of defense? Deodorant, good manners, capturing sediment, preventing erosion, planting trees. Uh, second one is inspection during winter shutdown is not necessary. And that's a true or false. We're at about 58, 61. We're at 70. <laughs> I guess we've stopped at 70. All right, I guess we're done. We'll take a look at it. The answer was prevent the erosion. The first line of defense is erosion control. You want to stop that from moving. Um, capturing the sediment, but at that point, your, your erosive forces have already taken control. Your sediment is on the move. Uh, so that's not your first line of defense. That's basically, you're scrambling at that point to pretend, uh, protect it. And planting trees uh, isn't the first line. It is a good method of uh, absorbing water and stabilizing soil. Um, but really preventing the erosion to begin with is, is what we're looking for. Um, as far as inspection at winter shutdown, um, no, you, uh, you are required to do inspections uh, every 30 days and then after every rain or snow melt event. So um, inspections are necessary. All right, so I got some pictures here. We're gonna kind of go through, I guess we're gonna do the uh, question and answer and. Uh, Type some questions in here, and or I'll, I won't type the questions. I'll show a screen, and uh, we'll ask you to point out the deficiencies. <laughs> some of them have a few, some of them have a lot, but uh, I guess we're done. I'll X that out. We'll go to the next one. Here's a uh, was number two, true or false? Um, let's see what was number two question. Inspection during winter shutdown are not necessary. Uh, that would be false. Because you definitely have to, you have to go back and do it every 30 days at a minimum, and then after every rainfall event, snow event. All right, here's question, here's uh, picture number one. Uh, anybody see some flaws with this? <laughs> no, sill fence is definitely not buried up six inches at the base. Uh, it's not dug in. So yeah, that is that is the main one right here. Uh, there's a lot of slack in it. How uh, about the construction fence? That that was kind of a waste. <laughs> yeah, it's not taunt. It's not buried. It's not gonna. It's not gonna do what it's supposed to do. Um, you can see it kind of goes down the hill a little bit. It could create some channeling. You know, it's not spread out. It's not buried. It's, there's a lot of flaws to it. Uh, this the installation, the time and effort they put into this was really a waste of time. Um, 
it was a waste of material and a waste of my time and it was ineffective. So yeah, a lot of problems with this one. All right, so um, improper placement of construction mess, absolutely. Well, yeah, you're right, the stakes are on the right side. They're on the downhill side. <laughs> I guess there's good things in everything. All right, we'll move on to the next one. Um, this is a compost filter sock. Um, it like, it's not a koi log, so it wasn't, can't be used as, not necessarily used as a check dam. I can't really tell the material from here. Um, but if it was used as a check dam, um, yeah, sock is damaged. Um, improper staking, no cleaning and maintenance. Yeah, all these needs to be cleaned upstream. There's a stream at the bottom too that you can see in the upper part of the picture where it flows. Uh, more needed, yeah, maintenance needed, it's damaged. Um, so yeah, there's again some flaws here. But again, as long as you're aware of them and you can recognize them, that's really the key. All right, so we'll go to the next question. How about this one? <laughs> They've actually put a piece of fabric underneath the grate. Um, that's, well, the problem with this is, I don't see anybody answering, is basically when you put fabric underneath it, it's, yeah, no good. <laughs> it doesn't allow any flow into it. Basically, it just creates a bowl uh, where the sediment and the water build up. Uh, it doesn't drain at all if it, if, if it drains any. Uh, once the sediment traps it in there, yeah, everything you see that you capture will end up in the culvert and end up downstream. Uh, possibility of fabric will rip. Um, so yeah, there's, there's problems with that. So you definitely don't want to do this, put something around it if you're going to protect that inlet. Um, yeah, definitely not effective. Um, other sites that you can see in the other sites part here too, there's no stabilization of around it at all, no effort made. Uh, the road to the left had been reclaimed. Uh, they're actually between the second, uh, they reclaimed it, went through the second run and compacted it and shaped it. But you can see it's still open. They haven't done any erosion control protection here. Um, this is actually a pretty hilly area. So yeah, this is not what you're looking to do. All right, we'll move on to the next one. This one's a doozy. How about this? <laughs> we can't wait for an overtime call. <laughs> yeah, there's a big gap. Um, the real catch with that is you shouldn't be using check dams in a channel. Uh, there are other products that are out there. Uh, it wasn't buried, so it's, it's really, again, another waste of time, waste of material, um, big gap. So this, this serves no purpose other than decoration on the side of the road. Um, it's don't use so many ways slides should be angular around. Uh, stone typically should be angular. Uh, round stones will, once they get momentum with the water behind them, they'll just roll with the water flow. Uh, so you definitely want angular material in there. Uh, but this wouldn't capture anything. This is really, uh, yeah, that this, that a wrong use of a silt fence to begin with and then uh, installed improperly. It definitely should use some, a different method. Again, there's different ones out there, whether it's a check dam or a koi log or whatever it might be. Uh, what's behind the curtain? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> All right, we'll go to this next one. This is our last one here. How about this one? See anything wrong with this site? <laughs> what is the recommended method of burying a silt fence? Um, essentially, you need to keep it, when you install the silt fence, you want to bury the, uh, bury the bottom of the silt fence with six inches of material. That'll keep as a ballast to keep the, the fence itself from blowing out. Um, you want to put the stakes on the downstream side. Um, you know, a few of those things that are out there. Um, no control. Yeah, in this picture, there's nothing. There's no effort at all. It's not, well, it's marshy, but I think it's because they've had a lot of rain. Um, yeah, no swales or ditches. Too much open land at one time. Exactly. That is exactly why the DEC shut this job down. <laughs> Yeah, no, oops, no, yeah, no collection plan, no control, no stabilization. Even the roadways, they've put in material, but there's still, there's no delineation between what is there. Um, 
Yeah, they've got some piles of stockpiles over here. There's no kind of protection around them. There's pretty much nothing. Um, no, I don't think there is any sill fence in this photograph. <laughs> no food truck. <laughs> well, there is no food truck. Well, it is one benefit. It is flat, but it's still, um, it still had a pitch to it. All right. Um, we're about done with all this, so we'll talk about a little bit what's coming up for us. Ooh, potholes, yeah, a lot of potholes. <laughs> Uh, some of what's coming up on Monday, this coming Monday, we've got a uh, bumper banner. Basically, David will be discussing some of the local, uh, not the local, but the latest uh, information related to everything that we're involved with right now. Uh, on Tuesday, David's going to do a uh, webinar, uh, Why Has My Road Failed Already? And that'll be worth one PDH. Uh, so that'll be a good one. Um, the town hall, it's uh, standard operating pre procedures in the time of COVID. Uh, so that'll be a discussion among superintendents and Try to get an idea what other people are doing out there. And then on Thursday, we've got a webinar, uh, Diffusing Stress Encounters, Basic Human Communication and tech te Techniques. Uh, this is more of a motiv motivational speaker. It's gonna be very informative. From what I've seen, it's gonna be very, very good. Uh, uh, I don't believe there'll be any PDHs for that, but it should be a good, a, a good session. So we hope that we see everybody there, and I guess uh, to take a few questions, we've got four minutes over, I guess, but. Um, I'd like to thank everybody. All right.